This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 22. Welcome to the 22nd episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I love hearing from you so if you enjoy today's show please stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes. You'll find the show notes for today's episode and all the podcast episodes at fertilityfriday.com slash podcast and you can find me on the Fertility Friday Facebook page which is facebook.com slash fertility Fridays. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. And I'm very excited to welcome the PCOS diva Amy Medling to the show today. Amy is a certified PCOS health coach who has helped thousands of women overcome their PCOS symptoms and restore their fertility naturally through the programs that she's developed. And after receiving her own diagnosis of PCOS herself, Amy embarked on her own journey to health by doing her own research and trying many different approaches until she discovered what really works. And she was able to heal herself and regain her fertility naturally. So today we'll be talking all about PCOS, what it is, and some of the ways that it can be healed naturally. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Amy. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you today. Uh, To give you a a bit of an introduction, but maybe you'd be able to tell us a little bit about your own fertility journey and how your experience with PCOS kind of um, inspired you to create PCOS Diva and help other women who are suffering from the the same condition. Sure. Well, I think um, when you talk to a lot of women with PCOS, uh, most of us realize that there's something not quite right with our bodies um, very early on in puberty. You know, we're not getting our periods. They're, they're not as regular as our friends. Um, our hair starts sprouting where it shouldn't be, um, or we start losing um, our, our, we have spinning hair or really bad acne um, and that doctors just sort of chalk up to stress or um, you know, our age. And so we kind of in, um, intrinsically sort of intuitively know that there's something not quite right, but it's often really hard to get a diagnosis. And that's what happened with me. I actually wasn't diagnosed until I was 30 um, and was trying to chart my cycles through NAPRO technology. Um, I don't know if you talk about that method of um, fertility uh, planning on I've heard of it, program. but I haven't had a chance to really delve into to the specifics of it yet. Well, I, I think it really helped me um, to, and I worked alongside a nurse practitioner that I used to meet with her um, on a monthly basis. And through my charting, she said, you know, has anybody told you that you had PCOS? And I said um, that it was something that I've always suspected, but I never got a diagnosis. And she really helped me to, you know, find the the right endocrinologist and and get the right blood work done um, and a pelvic uh, ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis. So I had been struggling with um, PCOS symptoms, and we can talk more about that in in a minute, um, through my, you know, teens and 20s. And... When I was uh, in my late 20s, you know, my, my husband and I wanted to start a family, and the doctor just kind of gave me a prescription of Clomid. I think he, he realized that my periods weren't regular, and I probably wasn't ovulating, and I needed a little something. And it really only took one dose of the Clomid, and I got pregnant. Um, but I probably should, should say that you know, a lot of doctors tell women with PCOS that it's going to be very difficult to get pregnant or it's going to be impossible to get pregnant without fertility treatments. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's sometimes um, to take that at face value, uh, you know, it, it, and believe that that's the absolute truth. You know, I think that most women with PCOS can get pregnant and studies have shown that. Um, and I think that you know, being a positive and realizing that it's it it's, 
you know, it may not be as much of a struggle as doctors lead you to believe. But so anyway, I did get pregnant, um, ignored the fact that doctors told me that they'd have to jump through hoops to get me pregnant or I wouldn't get pregnant. And I did after one dose of Clomid. And then I did suffer from some secondary infertility. You know, when we wanted to have another child, I really did have a hard time. And I had to go through several Clomid cycles and IUIs. And um, it wasn't until like the last cycle before I would have had to uh, think about IVF that I did get pregnant with my son, uh, my second son. And then after that pregnancy, my PCOS symptoms really... Um, kicked into gear, and I had a hard time recovering from that pregnancy and kind of getting my body back on track, and uh, and I was on metformin, too, in order to get pregnant that second time, and, and metformin is an off-label um, treatment for PCOS. It's a diabetic drug, but it helps to increase insulin sensitivity, and women with PCOS um, tend to have issues with insulin. So the metformin can really, can really help a lot of women, but it also comes for a lot of us with really uh, bad GI side effects. And that's what I was dealing with. And I swore I'd never go back on metformin. And I didn't want to go back on the pill to regulate my periods because the pill didn't make me feel good. So I was really embarked on this journey of trying to find an other, another way to manage my PCOS. And through a lot of trial and error, and at the time, I had been writing for the PCOS Association for their newsletter, so I had access to a lot of experts that I could kind of pick their brain for articles and um, interviewing them, you know, about their books. And so I was able to um, speak with a lot of people that were on the front line of PCOS research and um, really connected with some wonderful naturopath and functional medicine doctors. And through all of this trial and error and um, research, I was able to really bring my body back into balance, so much so that when I was 37, I woke up one day and thought that I had the flu, and I actually was pregnant, Mm -hmm. which was a big surprise because... I still was fertility charting, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think I did that great of a job. But um, so I was blessed with a, a beautiful little girl um, when I was 37. So, and that was completely natural. That's so amazing. That's really, my fertility journey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that your story gives a lot of hope um, to a lot of women listening, especially if they're suffering from PCOS, uh, especially what you said about kind of you know, taking what the doctor says and remembering that it, it's not necessarily like a, like a sentence, you know what I mean? Like you can, that there is hope and there are things that, that you can do. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, I guess, delving into some of the symptoms that you had, because you mentioned that you weren't diagnosed until you were about 30, but you mentioned that you did have these symptoms uh, throughout your 20s. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about what those symptoms were. Sure. So I just want to kind of clarify, I think polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's kind of a misnomer and uh, there's uh, an effort to get the name changed because it doesn't really reflect the the metabolic um, underlying sort of um, mechanism of PCOS because it isn't just about the ovaries. Um, and actually, about 30% of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome do not have polycystic ovaries. That's just one of the diagnosis criteria. So it's really a metabolic endocrine disorder that's found in women. It affects, you know, now they're saying as um, many as one in five women have PCOS symptoms. Um, but for a long time, uh, the the standard um number was 10% of women worldwide, and there's less than 70% of women, um, 70% of women are undiagnosed. So this is awareness about this syndrome is, needs to be um, really at the forefront because there's so many women that are walking around with PCOS, and PCOS is um, something that once you've developed it, it doesn't go away. It's present throughout um, a woman's lifespan through 
puberty, um, reproductive years, through post-menopause, and it affects all races and ethnic groups. So women with PCOS, they wrestle with an array of symptoms, including excess weight or resistant weight loss, irregular menstrual cycles, infertility. It's the leading cause of female infertility, depression, acne, hair loss, um, and then far-reaching health implications like the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and um, certain cancers as well. Um, And it really makes it so important to be able to manage. And I, I believe that you can um, manage so many of these symptoms through making um, meaningful lifestyle change. So, you know, there's, there's lots of, fortunately, there's some other symptoms as well. So anxiety is something that a lot of women with PCOS deal with, um, poor body image or eating disorders, um, sexual dysfunction, um, uh, excessive hair growth, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, skin tags, sleep apnea, um, the, the kind of darkening of different skin areas sort of under your armpit or the nape of neck. Um, some women have pelvic pain, um, painful boil-like abscesses in the groin area or underneath the armpits. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of not-so-nice symptoms, but again, so many of these things can be Manage through making lifestyle change. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think I think it's really important what you said that the the kind of title PCOS is kind of a misnomer because, as you said, when you think of polycystic ovary syndrome, you think ovary related, and uh, I know what I used to think is basically irregular ovulation kind of thing, and um, when it's really sporadic. And so the definition and the the symptoms that you listed, it's a wide array of symptoms that maybe in many cases women wouldn't necessarily attribute to PCOS. And um, I know that you mentioned that, uh, that, you know, insulin resistance plays a role in there. And you mentioned that it's more of a, more of a metabolic endocrine disorder. Um, maybe you could, did you want to maybe go into that a little bit and maybe talk about why this happens and, um, you know, I guess what's going on with, with our hormones to kind of create this disrupted state and, and also cause such a wide array of symptoms? Well, the, um, the elevated insulin, I mean, really kind of in a nutshell, it, um, it's, it sort of triggers uh, or elevates androgens. So androgens are kind of like that, that you would think of like as a male hormone, testosterone, and the testosterone kind of wreaks havoc on, um, you know, our female hormones. Um, but it isn't just testosterone. Women with PCOS also um, typically have low progesterone. So a lot of women with um, PCOS have like, you know, in their cycles, they might just kind of have light spotting bleeding that goes on for forever. Um, and that's like that, that low progesterone. Um, and also a, a real characteristic that I don't think a lot of people um, know or talk about is that because you have the low progesterone, um, estrogen becomes dominant. So, PCOS can often be really an issue of estrogen dominance. So there's a lot of different things going on, but when you um, are able to start controlling your blood sugar and your insulin and keep that kind of um, regulated throughout the day, you'll find that these other hormones begin to come back in balance. And I think another hormone that is something that we don't really hear a lot about in, in terms of it disrupt, disrupting our, um, kind of our hormone, hormonal balance is cortisol, and cortisol is a stress hormone. And women with PCOS don't um, seem to be able to manage stress maybe as well as their um, you know, non-PCOS counterparts. And so the cortisol... Um, when cortisol is increased in your body and elevated, then it becomes kind of like this really um, perfect storm for PCOS. It 
causes insulin to rise. It causes, um, one thing that I didn't mention is that women with PCOS are also um, at elevated risk for hypothyroidism Mm -hmm. or Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune um, hypothyroid condition. So cortisol, increased cortisol also lowers thyroid hormone and it lowers progesterone or it's sort of the cortisol kind of steals um, the cofactors of hormone production from from progesterone and also leads to more estrogen dominance. So for women with PCOS, it's really important to control insulin, but to control stress as well to kind of keep um, cortisol levels down. Mm -hmm. I think when we're looking at the, the endocrine system, it's important to remember that everything works together. And so if you have one area kind of off balance, it kind of tips over and everything is, is, is kind of out of balance in a way. And when it comes to, I guess, identifying, you know, you mentioned a kind of a scary statistic that uh, one in five women have symptoms of PCOS, some sort of symptom, and but only, but there's kind of a large number, 70% of women who are kind of undiagnosed. Why do you think that so many women aren't diagnosed or don't know they have PCOS? Well, I think you sort of touched upon it. There's like so many different symptoms and you might be going to the dermatologist to treat your acne. You're going to the, uh, your, you know, OBGYN to, you know, manage your cycles and you might be going to an endocrinologist because you have elevated blood sugar um, or, you know, your thyroid hormone is low. And these doctors, like, you really need them all kind of talking to each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you need sort of to have kind of a t- an integrative team approach so that, you know, pe- or, or you might go to the dermatologist as well for, like, hair falling out or the hair growth. And somebody sort of has to put all of these pieces together often to realize that you have a, a PCOS diagnosis. And I think, um, st- unfortunately, doctors are not, still are not all that educated about PCOS. I mean, there certainly are some wonderful uh, doctors out there, and I feature a lot of them on my uh, site, PCOSDiva.com, and expert interviews and guest posts. And they are out there, but it's just you really have to look for them. Um, and they, I think that a lot of doctors, because PCOS is so difficult to treat and it, um, in the office, I guess, with, you know, doctors are trained to prescribe meds. So, you know, they will still often prescribe metformin or um, the birth control pill and kind of send you on, on your way. But it takes time to really coach and and um, explain to women the, the type of lifestyle changes they need to make. But I think it's important for women to um, to gain the knowledge about how to get a diagnosis. You know, certainly, you know, we're talking about what the symptoms are, you know, how um, to get a diagnosis. So they can really advocate to ask for, um, to be tested for PCOS. But um, right now, the there's a couple different um, medical organizations that have kind of agreed upon a common diagnosis definition, and um, it's kind of dubbed the the Rotterdam criteria. And these criteria includes um, kind of original uh, parameters that were given by the National Institutes of Health and the Androgen and Excess and PCOS Society. So. For women to be diagnosed with PCOS, you need to have two out of the three criteria. So one being ovarian dysfunction, including lack of ovulation or less frequent ovulation. Number two would be high levels of androgen hormones, including DHEA, testosterone. Um, And number three would be the polycystic ovaries that would be viewed on a pelvic ultrasound. So you can um, have really regular periods, but have the polycystic ovaries and the high androgen and be considered PCOS. Um, Or you could have um, irregular periods and elevated androgens, but no polycystic ovaries and still have um, PCOS. But in addition to that diagnosis, then you really want to have some, um, you know, your doctor wants to be checking certain lab tests, 
and you know we could kind of go into some of the the tests that you know I think are important for PCOS if you want. Okay. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to kind of clarify. Could you maybe describe? So when you said uh, polycystic ovaries, what exactly is that for our listeners who might not not know what it what it is? Okay. So. Um, you know, when a woman's kind of going through um, a monthly cycle, there'll be one um, ovary on, I mean, one um, follicle on her ovary that will develop um, and then burst and release the egg. But for women with PCOS, you can, um, often the follicle doesn't develop, and so you have multiple, like, underdeveloped follicles. And on um, the ultrasound, it often looks sort of like a sta- the classic um, look of it. It would be like a string of pearls around your ovary. Mm. So often you'll see um, different PCOS organizations kind of refer to that pearl kind of analogy. Um, but so it would look like a string of pearls on your ovaries if you had a um, polycystic ovary. Okay. So kind and of- the other thing to, to mention too is that not everybody that has polycystic ovaries also has PCOS. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's, it's really probably not the best um, name for the syndrome. Yeah, because it's just one of the factors that doesn't even have to be present in order for it to be, um, to be diagnosed. And so it's kind of like your ovaries are trying to ovulate and they end, you end up having all of these different follicles being produced, but maybe none of them end up bursting right right because you know your your progest yeah your progesterone isn't rising it's kind of chronically low um and and that's a real issue for pcos okay and so maybe we can get into some of the lab testing that doctors would need to do in order to kind of confirm the diagnosis yeah so you definitely want to um have your testosterone checked, um, total testosterone, free testosterone. Um, the, the LH-FSH ratio, a normal ratio is 1 to 2, but women with PCOS have ratios of 2 to 1 or 3 to 1. So that LH-FSH ratio in PCOS, it's not part of the clinical diagnosis, um, but it can often... Um, kind of point to an issue for sure. Um, DHEA is important, kind of measures levels of androgens in your body. Um, it, uh, so like really looking at the androgens, and that's what doctors would be testing, um, the F- LH-FSH ratio. Uh, I think it's really important for women with PCOS, and we didn't, we didn't mention this um, yet, but liver functioning tests are important. Many women with PCOS, because of the insulin resistance, have um, developed fatty liver disease. So it's important to kind of make sure that your liver is monitored. Um, PCOS, there's a real underlying issue of inflammation. It's kind of like you're sort of in this chronic inflammatory state. So... I have a wonderful um, podcast that I just recorded on my site with um, Dr. Felice Gersh, and we talked all about taming the flames of PCOS, and she talked about really delving into um, t- to test your inflammatory markers. But this, um, I-, I usually recommend um, the C-reactive protein test. Um, it's the high-sensitivity C-reactive protein test, um, HA. HSCRP. So levels over three may indicate increased inflammatory response. So when you have a, like this, when you're in a state of chronic inflammation, it's also a risk factor for um, many chronic conditions, including heart disease. And women with PCOS have that elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's really important. I think that's something that a lot of doctors skip, but. Um, If you want more information, check out my podcast with Dr. Felice Gersh. Um, Also, really looking at your um, blood sugar and insulin response, so fasting insulin, fasting blood glucose, um, 
hemoglobin A1C. That, that's a great test because it measures long-term blood sugar levels over three months. Um, greater than 5.7 may indicate increased risk for PCOS uh, and or diabetes. So it's really important. I know a lot of women who are successfully managing their PCOS are you know, really looking at that number. Hmm. And vitamin D, it's, vitamin D is one of those nutrients that women with PCOS seem to be chronically low. And I think a lot of doctors um, are not testing. So definitely want to have your vitamin D levels and levels. Um, you know, I, I think they should be more than, um, you know, 50. So I, I think vitamin D is important. And also vitamin B12 is another nutrient to look at. Uh, a lot of women with PCOS are on metformin, and metformin depletes B12 levels, and your doctor should really be testing B12 um, regularly if you're on metformin, or, um, and you should certainly be su- uh, supplementing with a, a methylated methylcobalamin form of B12, uh, but I think a lot of doctors don't know that, so that's why it's so important to be, you know, be knowledgeable and advocate for yourself. So getting your, um, you know, your blood uh, tested for for B12. And, you know, certainly if uh, metabolic profile, um, I think sex hormone binding globulin is important. And then you really want a complete thyroid uh, panel. And just testing TSH isn't enough. You really want to be looking at, in addition, free T4, T3, reverse T3, um, and you know even total T3, total T4, and then your your thyroid antibodies because I had mentioned earlier that women with PCOS are at higher risk of Hashimoto's, and um, so you want to have your thyroid antibodies tested as well, and then you really want to keep on top of your lipids, so you know making sure you know you're looking at your triglycerides and your HDL, LDL, total to cholesterol. I think all of those are really important um, to, you know, if you get the PCOS diagnosis or in the process to kind of look at all of those labs. Mm -hmm. And I think it's... um especially when you go into um, a doctor, (laughs) a doctor's office kind of with a plan and with a list of tests that you want done, you really have to make sure you have a a really good uh, doctor who's willing to do the tests. I know that, um, like I have a hypothyroid, I have Hashimoto's, and um, I know I've had some struggles getting my doctor to do the antibodies test. I don't want to do it. So you kind of have to, I guess, just work with you know what I mean? Try to make sure you find a doctor that's really open and willing to give you the tests that you need and open and willing to kind of listen to you and and hopefully being especially knowledgeable about the particular area that you're struggling with. Yeah, and I think it's important to realize that these the doctor ultimately is working for you, you know, you're uh, and um and it may take a while to to locate somebody that you feel like you can kind of be in um can be sort of your health you know, advocate and partner. Um, and I have, I, I put together a uh, one-on-one guide on my site that lists all of these tests and also um, kind of gives you some guidance in the normal ranges. And also I, I have a, um, a section about assembling your healthcare team and kind of questions to um, ask your doctor, the different types of doctors that you may want to work with um, and just uh, you know, ways to, um, I guess, do the due diligence up front to find um, a doctor that will, you know, work for you. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, yeah, those are important resources that you've made. And I'll make sure to, to link the podcast that you mentioned, as well as um, the guide and also those, those posts so that our listeners can have that information to follow up because it's, uh, it's such an important part of the process. If you can't have access to the tests that you need to make sure that you're healthy in all these different areas, then that's a huge, obviously, block to, to kind of at least knowing where you are, knowing where you're starting off from. And um, I wanted to dial it back a little bit because what I found really interesting kind of going back to your introduction was that you kind of identified, you know, initially your PCOS through 
charting with NAPRO technology. And so for the listeners, uh, you know, out there, since this is the Fertility Friday podcast, and we talk a lot about fertility awareness charting and charting your cycles and how it can really, how different issues can show up on your charts in different ways. Uh, maybe, you know, we could talk a little bit about how the PCOS showed up on your chart and what are some of the things that, that you noticed that kind of weren't within the, the normal ranges that kind of triggered you to look into it further? Well, I think um, it's, it's been a while. So it's my daughter is now six. So this is like, what, eight years ago, seven years ago, um, longer than that. But, um, you know, I think, again, it, we, I talked about the low progesterone. So I wasn't, I wasn't ovulating. I wasn't having um, the ovulatory, um, you know, the like signs, the mucus. Um, wasn't wasn't really that that good quality mucus wasn't there. Um, with Napro technology, you're just um, making observations, and there, it, you don't do any of the temperature charting, um, which I, I think is probably a really nice compliment to observations. But and you use these little stickers that you stick on your chart, and I remember. Um, I had lots of yellow baby stickers, and the yellow is kind of like that non-ovulatory mucus, and I was going, you know, all month long with, without really any good quality um, mucus. So that was probably what I, I'm thinking now, knowing what I know now, is probably why the, the nurse um, thought that I probably had PCOS because of the anovulatory cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anovulatory cycle and then kind of that continuous mucus situation where in a healthy cycle you're actually seeing, like you said, the good quality cervical mucus that helps you have baby, obviously. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and and it wasn't, and I did, and I did obviously, I mean, I was ovulating from time to time, but it wasn't every month. Um, and that's sort of typical of PCOS. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, one of the things I talk about on the show so, so much is just about how fertility awareness charting, regardless of what method you're using, but it gives you so much information about your, your overall health. So yeah. often women kind of get into it, whether they're trying to get pregnant or looking for a hormone free method of birth control without really realizing that you're kind of opening up a window into your health. And I think that for for women who are charting, they kind of have that added advantage of, of being able to see right away that there's something wrong, that it's not making sense, that I'm not ovulating, you know, regularly, or that I'm not ovulating at all, or <laughs> but whatever it is. And I think that that, in addition to, you know, working with your health professionals, it can give you just way more information about what's happening. And I think that once you start, you know, working with a health practitioner and actually addressing these issues, you can see your progress because you'll see that your cycles will change hopefully towards a more healthier, healthier place. And so kind of getting into, I guess, shifting gears a little bit, what are some of the ways that, um, that women can address PCOS? I know that when you go to a doctor, as you mentioned, it's kind of metformin or the pill. And one of the things that you said about metformin is that it depletes vitamin B12 and B12 is so important when you're trying to get pregnant. <laughs> so that, of course, right. made, me, <laughs> made me think about that aspect of it. So what are some of the ways that, uh, that you've worked with clients and helped women to um, address their PCOS naturally? Well, so I'm a certified health coach. And uh, in my practice, I'm really taking a holistic approach to managing PCOS. So it's not just diet and just exercise. It's really um, looking at, um, you know, yourself as, as a, you know, an, an entire person. Um, and in my private coaching practice, you know, we work on what I call um, primary food in addition to, you know, the food that we're eating. So primary food would be, you know, how, how are you in your life? You know, what's your, um, are you feeling fulfilled in your career, in your relationships, in your um, uh, spiritual practice? Do you have time for fun and pleasure? Um, and, you know, are you, do you have a creative outlet? I think um, w a lot of women with PCOS have really suppressed themselves cre um, from a creative standpoint. And if you think about it, uh, you know, 
ovulation and, and the ovaries is really that center of creation. Um, and so I find that, I know it sounds a little woo-woo and out there, but women with PCOS that really tap into that creative side and they tend to be very creative, that it really helps with the healing um, and bringing their body back into balance. So, and also look, looking at a positive mindset and approach to life. I think a lot of women with PCOS tend to have a real lack mentality, like they're, they're not enough. There's never enough time. There's never enough money. And we start shifting to a more positive, um, abundant mindset that things start to really shift for them as well. Um, But, you know, getting down to kind of the nitty-gritty of making lifestyle change, I have a program called um, the PCOS Diva Jumpstart. It's a seven-day live coaching um, group online program. Mm -hmm. And... We are tackling um, five different pillars of uh, lifestyle change. And the first one is a a diva sizzles in the kitchen. And getting into the kitchen and cooking real quality whole food is just so important. Getting away from relying on processed packaged food and using food as as a tool and a medicine to heal is really at the cornerstone of this Jumpstart program and and my approach. Um, So we're really teaching women to get in the kitchen and cooking food. And then the second is a diva has discriminating tastes. So we have to be really choosy and careful about what we put in our mouth. And I find that um, dairy and gluten, they're very inflammatory, and it really adds to that inflammation that we're trying to quell, So, and as well as processed soy. So getting away from um, those inflammatory foods and adding in lots of green veggies and, um, you know, limited whole gluten-free grains and, you know, more of like the starchy root vegetables, we have to kind of eat those in the, in the right balance. Um, and then lots of clean protein. I, I think it's really hard for women with PCOS to be vegan or, or vegetarian. Um, I think I, I see women have the most success when they do have clean animal protein, so grass-fed beef, wild seafood, um, organic, poultry. Um, you know, some women do well with legumes and some do not so really kind of figuring out what food works best for you and then eating the food in a very mindful way I think is making that kind of mind body spirit connection to food is so important as well and then learning how to move your body in ways that make you feel good and it it doesn't um it isn't just about chronic cardio, getting on the, the treadmill or the stair climber at the gym. It's about exercising in a way that is kind of reconnects you, I think, with your childhood, whether you like to ride bikes or dance or um, jump rope or, you know, whatever makes it more sustainable so that you stick with it. But then also adding things like yoga, which helps to calm that cortisol um, response and then also strength training and high intensity interval kind of um, with strength training is really key for women with PCOS. And then a diva practices self-care is the the fourth um, pillar. And I think that's one of the reasons that I called um, my business PCOS Diva is that when I started really taking care of myself and Um, putting myself first, making sure that I got what I needed, my husband started calling me a diva. He's Mm -hmm. like, boy, you've really become a diva. Like, I'd be at a restaurant and I'd um, be really advocating and and ordering exactly what I wanted rather than maybe something that was on the menu. And um, and that's when, when things started to really change for the better for me. So practicing self care is just so essential. And then finally, a a diva is powerfully positive. So really working on that internal chatter, that negative self-talk and limiting beliefs that I think a lot of us um, deal with. And that really 
gives you a nice foundation to then kind of go off and live this lifestyle and begin to uh, manage your PCOS naturally. And then uh, also on top of that, too, is supplements. I think natural supplements are a, a real key factor. I think women with PCOS tend to be, say, overfed and undernourished. And we're missing, um, or our body, for some reason, um, it doesn't, well, how do I explain it? It, it? it can't convert a lot of um, food to certain minerals and, and um, nutrients that we really need. Mm-hmm. So we need to supplement. Mm-hmm. I think that, yeah, I, I really love the, the program that you've developed and uh, as you were describing it, what I really loved about it as well is that you're really looking at the whole woman. You know, you're looking at, you know, not just her diet or her exercise, but you're looking at her, you know, her emotional state, her, the joy in her life and really kind of getting down to not just addressing the physical problem, but acknowledging that the, the physical problems that you're experiencing are related to to your whole self I mean you're a whole person and so you know I've I've I did a podcast with uh, Alexandra Sipos Kosicks and she's a um, a law of attraction life coach and she talked about you know the power of looking at your emotions and really looking at the way that you um, look at things and really trying to change the negative thought processes and really trying to focus more on what's happening right now and and kind of being more positive and I just I love that you incorporate that into everything that you're doing and I think that's a really important message because I think that there's often this idea that well I have this problem but as long as I take these supplements everything will be fine (laughs) and it's way more than that I mean taking the supplements is an important aspect the right supplements, of course, is an important aspect of the healing process. But if you're not addressing diet, if you're not addressing lifestyle, if you're not addressing your stress, if you're not addressing even just the fact that maybe you're not, you don't have enough joy in your life and you don't have a creative outlet and you don't have any type of relaxation or relaxation practice, then you could be doing all this work. But if you don't reduce your stress, I mean, scientifically speaking, your cortisol levels will still be out of control. And so, you know, you still have, you're not really addressing all of it. So, so yeah, I really love that about your approach. Well, I I was just going to say, um, and really, I think at the core of all of that is, is self-love. Um, and, and I know if I were to look back, if I, um, you know, my, probably the biggest breakthrough that helped me with PCOS is, to, to really begin loving myself in the moment, not when I lost 10 pounds or my skin cleared up, um, but just really being my authentic self, listening to my intuition, hearing what my body was telling me it needed, and um, spending more time alone with myself, um, and just really beginning to grow to love and, and kind of relish who I was, who I am. And at beginning to appreciate my body for what it does for me every day. And I think from this place of enoughness, you know, realizing that I am enough just the way I am and that deep acceptance, is that's when I was able to start making lasting healing and sustainable change. It was really being able to make the positive choices day in and day out, you know, the food choices, the movement choices, the self-care based on that loving vision rather than kind of staying stuck in the past or focused so much on some, you know, point that may or may not happen in the future. Um, So, and I think for a lot of women too, going, and then I see it with women that I coach, going through that fertility cycle to try to be more in the moment um, and just surrender. (laughs) I think that's hard when you're so focused on, you know, ha- getting pregnant, but to be able to just do the best you can from that place of self-love and surrender to, to the moment, um, it, it, was a, it was really a lifesaver for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, it just, yeah, it echoes, it echoes what it's the, it's kind of like common threads that, that kind of go through the different episodes that I've recorded but it's such an, it's so hard, <laughs> especially when you, 
I mean, wanting to have a baby and not being able to, I don't know if there's anything else in the world that could be as stressful and as frustrating yeah. and as heartbreaking, you know, but at the same time, I mean, there's something to be said for trying to just be in the moment and trying to surrender to what happens because ultimately it's, it's not, it's not up to you. <laughs> right. Well, and so for women listening, I mean, we, you've outlined, you know, and of course, I'll, as, as I mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll link to, to the program that you, that you were talking about. So for all the women listening, um, definitely check the show notes and you'll be able to, to kind of track back to Amy's site and look through all of the information that we've talked about today, especially if you're interested in signing up for the, the program, if, especially if this is something that you've been struggling with. But for women listening and now they have all this information and they know, okay, there's, there's something I can do and I can do it naturally. But of course, I would imagine that, you know, you're not going to start changing your lifestyle and your diet and have everything just be perfect within a week. So how does it typically, how long does it typically take? Or I guess, what would you tell um, a new PCOS diva to kind of expect in terms of how long it, it, it would take to heal her menstrual cycles and kind of get back into more healthy, um, healthy cycle, I guess you could say? Well, you know, everyone, and this is something that I talk a lot about, you know, we're all bio individuals. And certainly with PCOS, there it doesn't manifest itself the same way in everyone. Um, I interviewed uh, Dr. Mark Perlow, and he talked about there's just so many um, genetic components of PCOS that there's so, you know, there's thousands of different kind of combinations. Um, so I think realizing that we're, we're all unique, certainly is when it comes to PCOS, is just important. But, you know, there's been women that within the seven days of the Jumpstart program, just this new lifestyle, they've, you know, their period has come back and they haven't had it for months. Um, But that certainly isn't everyone. And then there's, you know, for me, I know it took me months, um, I would say, you know, six to eight months before my body really kind of got back in balance. And this is like post pill, you know, coming off of the pill and, and um, these other pharmaceutical drugs and, you know, learning to adopt a a healthier uh, lifestyle. So it just, I think it really depends. But certainly, you know, making these positive changes, um, you know, eating whole foods and moving your body in ways that, you know, is good for it and feels good and and eliminating or reducing, well, I don't think we ever eliminate stress, but reducing stress or learning how to cope with stress those things change us in a way, like on the inside, you know, we may not see the, the outside appearances, but it's changing, you know, our, our cellular structure. And we essentially, I don't know if you've heard how, you know, our, our cells regenerate and we basically get a new body every seven years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's really, we are what we eat and making these positive daily choices are, are helping in ways that we, we can't see with our with our eyes I guess but um, and, you know I talk a lot about women uh, feeling how their body feels and really getting in touch with how food makes them feel so that they can make choices based on that feeling and I think it's really important when you start coming off of gluten and dairy to kind of experiment with it you know how do you feel off of it how do you feel if you add it back in you know, and have a bagel for breakfast one morning and cream cheese. Like, how does that make you feel? Um, and I think that, that that really moves people along um, and, and helps build momentum because not, really, when you think about it, nothing tastes as good as feeling good feels. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And and I think once you start making those choices for yourself, initially it might feel like pain, <laughs> And might feel like you're kind of restricting yourself, but once you find kind of a, it's kind of like what you were talking about with self care. I mean, once you decide to put yourself first and and start doing what's best for yourself, what's best for your body, and um, you know, just in general, putting yourself first and your health first, I think it becomes easier and it becomes more of a habit because, as you said, once you can identify how you feel when you eat the foods that aren't good for your body, then you'll really just want to feel good. 
and it won't be like a chore anymore. Right, and, it, and it's not it's not from a place of what I call deprivation and denial. Um, it, it's from a place of self love. Like I'm not going to have this piece of you know pepperoni pizza because I love my body enough that I don't want all that inflammation that that food is going to cause, and I'm going to make you know a better choice because. You know, I love and you know I love my body, and I love what it does for me, and I want to do what's best for it. Mm-hmm. Well, and it goes along with what you said of of really kind of taking some time and really being appreciative, as you said, for what your body does for you. And I think it's I think it's easy for us to just take a lot of things for granted. <laughs> a random example that's sort of related, but I recently threw my back out. Like I'm pretty young, so it was pretty jarring to be <laughs> kind of in able to like walk around and stuff for a couple of days. So I was in my chiropractor's office and he fixed me right up. But I guess my point is just that we often take for granted just the, the, the miracle that is our, our lives and our bodies and all the things that our bodies are doing for us and to really have that love and appreciation for our bodies. And I, I think that makes it easier for us to make positive choices, whether it's with diet or exercise or sleep or, um, stress reduction just because we're doing it out of love you know for ourselves and and I think yeah I just love that message and I think I hope that it, it helps the listeners you know because I, I yeah it's just something that one of the reasons even why I do this podcast it's just to kind of really challenge some of the common ideas around health and around fertility and I always say that it can't hurt if you take the time to really be mindful and really change your diet for the better and, and exercise and it, it, there's, there's really no downside here. Yeah, and I think you touched upon something really important, which is gratitude. And I think it's so easy, especially, and, and, you know, I've been there, you know, going through that fertility journey and feeling like, you know, my body being angry, like my body's not doing what it's supposed to. It's not, you know, looking at all your friends that are getting pregnant, it's so easy to, to fall into this negative spiral but I think it's gratitude that's kind of the anchor that kind of helps to pull you out of that like think about all of the blessings that you have and and everything that is going right and and that um it just elevates you to to a higher plane and it I I think it helps the whole healing process as well Mm -hmm. well and just a a few questions to wrap up today's interview um one of the things I wanted to ask you is, so for for anyone who's listening and maybe they're suffering from PCOS or or they have symptoms or either way, they're maybe they're trying to get pregnant and it's not happening for one reason or another. What advice, if any, would you would you give to that listener? Well, I think um, I really want to leave people with a, a message of hope and. Um, I, th- I think there's uh, so much hope for women with PCOS. There's, there's a lot of research being done, and um, I think that you don't have to be in the place of being a victim. You know, educating, listening to podcasts like this, and there's, there's so much information out there. I have, uh, you know, my, my site. I have hundreds of articles on my site um, that can really help. You, know, you don't have to feel out of control, hopeless or helpless. Um, you can, you know, and, and in my, um, my articles and on my website, um, I often like refer to the butterfly. I think the butterfly is really a wonderful symbol for PCOS. And I truly believe when you take time to patiently and persistently positively work on yourself, um, you can absolutely emerge transformed. And I have seen this in hundreds of women on their PCOS journey. So it's really up to you. It's up to you to take that step. And um, you know, I believe that this kind of healing and transformation is based on hope, that connection with our higher selves and taking a more meditative and mindful approach to our life. And I think just knowing that you have the power to reclaim your life, um, but it really, it's up to you to take your first steps. And I love um, the the wisdom from Lao Tzu, a a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And I think just listening to this podcast today is is a really a great first step. And certainly look to download my um, PCOS 101 guide. 
Uh, there's just a ton of great um, evidence-based information there as well to help you. Mm-hmm. And what would you say is the biggest or one of the biggest misconceptions about PCOS that you would actually like to see corrected? Well, I think that it's just a reproductive issue. It's a, it's a lifelong issue that um, needs, it's a syndrome that needs to be managed from, you know, puberty to postmenopause. And I think probably the biggest misconception is that it's an ovary issue, that it, um, you know, removing your ovaries after you've done, you know, after you're finished with your um, reproductive years will take care of PCOS. And I can't tell you how many women take this, like, drastic step. And that is, it's just such, um, it's not true. It it will exacerbate the symptoms um, and kind of put you into, like, a kind of a chemical menopause. So um, if your doctor is suggesting um, hysterectomy for just PCOS symptoms alone, um, I would be be getting um, multiple opinions. So I think those are probably the two misconceptions that I'm I'm seeing a lot of. I think that's the scariest thing I've heard <laughs> all day. Oh, it's, maybe yeah, it just it's never really occurred crazy, to me that it's happening. Wow, maybe it just never occurred to me that doctors would actually suggest taking out your ovaries for PCOS. That's um, that's actually pretty uh, jarring for me <laughs> to hear because. Because, yeah, you, your body does need the low level of hormones. At, you know, after menopause, that your your body keeps producing, you, you kind of need those. <laughs> well, and it also just women with PCOS often deal with, um, you know, a hard time losing weight. And you, you take you take out the, the ovaries that you know, are still helping to regulate, you know, a lot of your hormones. And, and then it just it makes it harder to lose weight. And the PCOS symptoms actually seem to increase and and, um so i I just really want to get that word out um you know say no to hysterectomies solely for pcos symptoms Mm -hmm. well i'm so glad that you mentioned that because um, something that i wasn't really aware of so i'm guessing that many of the listeners may not have been aware of it either so one very last question that i I usually ask all of my guests which is uh, for women who are currently on the pill but you know right now they don't want to have babies, but maybe within the next couple of years uh, they, they know they want to start trying. What advice, if any, would you give to them? Uh, I'm, I'm very anti-pill um, for, for a number of reasons, and um, I've interviewed many experts on PCOS Diva, and um, it's, you know, most of the functional medicine practitioners who um, are, you know, really know what's going on, are going to tell you this, the same thing. And the pill, especially for women with PCOS, um, there's been studies that have shown that it increases um, your risk for blood clots. And I can't tell you how many women that I've heard from in their 20s and, and early 30s who have had life-threatening blood clots because of the pill and, and PCOS. That's probably number one, um, but certainly low libido, it um, depletes nutrients. I just think, and, and I have articles on my site about the downsides of the pill for treating PCOS because it is a, a common treatment, um, and, but you can, and if you're using it to regulate periods, you, you really can get to a point through you know, managing lifestyle where most women can you know, get re- um, kind of reclaim their their cycles um, without the pill, and you know there's other f- forms of birth control. I know a lot of the um, experts that I interview, and I always ask them the question about the pill, and you know what would the alternative be? And you know barrier methods and the copper IUD seems to be um, you know what most most doctors are recommending that that I respect. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I really appreciate, I really appreciate your perspective on that. I recently did an interview with Holly Griggs Ball, who wrote Sweetening the Pill. And after the discussion that we had about the pill, uh, obviously, everyone has to choose what's best for them. But it's so important for women to know the potential downsides 
that the doctors really aren't telling you. <laughs> the doctors don't tell you that it could affect your libido negatively. They don't really tell you that it could lead to depression. They don't really tell you all of the side effects that kind of aren't mainstream about the pill. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. I was also just going to say that it also increases insulin resistance often, which is for women with PCOS is what we're really trying to avoid. So um, that's another downside. Mm -hmm. It's so important to know because it's just, it's scary to me that it's prescribed as a treatment because it obviously doesn't treat it. It's kind of, um, when I, when I did my podcast episode with Dr. Laura Bryden, she basically said, you know, the doctors are trying to force a bleed with the pill uh, to kind of make everyone feel better. <laughs> so you're not getting your period. So you take hormones and then you have a withdrawal bleed, but that has nothing to do with a period. That's not menstruation. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Dr. Laura is great. Mm-hmm. Well, how can our listeners get in touch with you, Amy, and find out more about the work that you do? Uh, so I, I'm at www.pcosdiva.com. I also have a very active uh, Facebook page and Pinterest boards. And, um, and you know, if anybody wants to reach out to me, they can send me an email, amy at pcosdiva.com. Um, I, I, you know, I love, I love hearing from, uh, from divas. So please reach out. Okay, well, Amy, I just want to thank you so much for, for being on the show today. Uh, this was such a great episode with so much really great information about PCOS. I think that the listeners will really get a lot out of this, especially to talk about a condition that's so common, but I think so commonly misunderstood as well. And so I really appreciate you being so generous with your time and sharing your knowledge and your experience and your insight. And um you know, make sure to go check out for all the listeners, make sure to go check out PCOSDiva.com. Amy has a podcast as well with, like she said, a lot of interviews with medical professionals specifically in the area of PCOS. So it's an absolutely fantastic resource. So make sure to check it out if this is something that is on your radar. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here with you this morning, Lisa. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please make sure to share it with a friend. If you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, just search for Fertility Friday on iTunes or Stitcher and make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And of course, if you're loving the show, please stop by and leave a five-star review on iTunes so that more people can find it. As for me, you can find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. You can stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes for today's episode, which you'll find at fertilityfriday.com slash PCOSDiva. And you can also find me on the Fertility Friday Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Fertility Fridays with an S. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.